Hi, I'm Dr. Derek Lee. It's my pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Daryl M. Tonacci, who's a spine surgeon at the Institute for Spine and Scoliosis. Welcome, doctor. Thank you for having me. Okay. I always like to ask uh, surgeons from the start, what was your initial interest in medicine and how did you basically evolve in terms of becoming an orthopedic spine surgeon? Um, so I'm the youngest of six kids and uh, five of us are in the medical uh, uh, field. And uh, so I had this pathway ahead of me of following all my brothers and sisters as they went through medicine. And then I always tell people also, once you get to medical school and, and slightly uh, into that, there's a field in medicine for every personality. Mm -hmm. And I gravitated towards spine surgery. Um, and then I focused on many different areas. I'm in practice now for almost 20 years, 21 years, I think. And uh, you spent, I have spent several years in focusing on different aspects of spine surgery until about seven years ago, I started focusing very specifically on scoliosis uh, with the, set, uh, the technique that we're talking about today. I know initially you were in private practice by yourself, but then you started to um, create the, the famous ABC team. Can you talk Correct. a little bit about how that developed and how you brought everyone together? Correct. So as, as I was uh, saying, about seven years ago is when I started to bring that team together. Uh, and the way that worked was I've always been in this practice here in Princeton, New Jersey, which is about 35, 40 minutes from Shriners Hospital in Philadelphia. And I was always a consultant there for many years since I started. Dr. Betts used to be the head of Shriners uh, um, Hospital, as you know. And uh, so I, I've known him since the 90s. And I used to go at once a week to Shriners Hospital, do volunteer surgery and, and work uh, in a volunteer capacity. And over the years, as we developed, uh, as you know, the technique for VBT and things at Shriners, um, I kept saying to Dr. Betts, why don't you leave Shriners, right. come join my practice so that we'll, I'll focus just on VBT and uh, I'll give up all metal rod surgery and all that that I was doing for the prior 15 years. We'll focus just on VBT and as a think tank, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll focus on that. And Dr. Cudahy, who is the C, so it's Dr. A is me, Dr. B, Betts, and Dr. C, Cudahy, um, she was our fellow at Shriners 12 years ago. So 12 years ago, she left there, became my uh, partner, and she's been assisting me on every single surgery for the last 12 years. Uh, and so that's how we formed. And six, seven years ago, I said, Dr. Betts, we were talking about it. And I said, you know, he doesn't really operate. I, I do all the surgery with Dr. Cuddy, but as a think tank, we were able to progress the field dramatically fast uh, because it's different than being in your own practice or being in your own university setting where you don't necessarily have the feedback uh, of someone. And with the think tank of the three of us, that's how we made so much progress. So initially with your uh, exposure to Dr. Bass and to Shriners um, and the development of vertebral body stapling, and then to VBT, and then to ASC. What did you see early on in terms of the potential of VBT that made you want to focus almost solely on VBT yeah, or it's feathering? A, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's all about history and context, right? And how you evolve, and it's very interesting one. If you go back to about 2007 or eight, uh, there was about a group of 30 of us in the country, in the US, uh, that were trying to do metal rods more from the front than the back. And we were trying to do that. Uh, and it was me and Dr. Lahner in New York, we used to work together. And we were the group in New York that was doing the metal rods from the front. Uh, Shriners was doing some metal rods and then a group in uh, California also. Um, out of those 30 people, uh, about five, us at Shriners and, and uh, Peter Newton in California started to do VBT about seven, eight years ago. Why we chose metal rods from the front was simply about invasiveness of surgery. If you do metal rods from the back, that's a very large surgery, as you know. It takes uh, not just a year to recover from a metal rod fusion, whether you go from the front or back, but if you go from the front, you can get back to school faster. Right? It's not as invasive a surgery. This is a natural plane when you're working inside the chest, and the back is a man-made plane. You have to strip a lot of muscles. So even if you're doing metal rod fusion surgery, it's still a faster recovery from the front. And so at those 30 people at that time, 2007, eight, nine, we were, we were focusing on doing metal rods from the front. Then around 2012, 13, the idea started to evolve between Shriners and the group in California about placing a, a flexible cord instead of the metal rod. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, and that came about because the, the cord has been around since 1999. It was developed for low back surgery. And that original instrumentation set was for low back surgery. We were not thinking of it in terms of scoliosis until about 2012, uh, 11, 12. And that evolved, like I said, out of the group of Shriners, us and, and uh, out of Fat California. And by the time we were talking about the cord or thinking about it, we had gotten really slick with the anterior metal rod surgery okay. to the point where we were doing the metal rod surgery through a scope, through a telescope. All right. And so it didn't apply to every surgery because obviously if you're working through a scope, you can only handle certain types of curves. But when we started to think about using a flexible cord instead of a metal rod, it was a natural extension for us to say, well, okay, instead of sticking the metal rod in, we'll slip the metal rod through, the cord through, through the same technique. That initial technique became VBT. And very specific reasons for that and very specific reasons for the word tether. If you have a curve, that is bigger than 60 degrees, well, with the scope and the uh, cameras, you can't get to it. So we knew that we couldn't do any curves above 60. If you are trying to correct a curve with the scope, well, we knew we could only get down to about 30. With metal rods, you could get a little bit better because the rod is stiff and it would push down into the curve. Mm -hmm. With cord, you, can, you can't get the correction below 30. So instead of saying, well, let's change the technique, we basically said, well, that means we can't do curves that are over 60 in the chest. We have to have curves that are flexible of 30 on their own. We're going to hold them at 30. We're gonna tether it and let it grow itself out. Mm -hmm. okay? That's where the word tethering came from because we knew that it was a passive surgery. We yes. weren't actively correcting. So we defined the candidates for the technique. And that was about nine years ago. So if the curve is over 60 degrees, you can't do it has to be flexible to 30 on its own, and you have to have a growing kid. And if you go look up the qualifications for VBT, even today, those are the qualifications. Yes. And it's also only in the chest. So when seven years ago, six years ago, when I got Randy to leave Shriners and join the practice, that light bulb went off within about two months of us being together. And that light bulb was, well, the only reason I'm not doing a bigger curve, the only reason I'm not doing a stiffer curve, the only reason I'm not doing a more mature curve with someone that doesn't have growth is because I'm limited by the camera and the scope system. Right. So I converted the surgery to a mini open procedure. That mini open procedure is not any more invasive because you're still working within the chest, right? It's still, you know, at this point, it's still four weeks back to school, six weeks back to sports, even, even with the mini open incision of, as opposed to a camera, about the same, but it opened up the whirlwind bag of who we could treat. And so now I'm not restricted, you know, uh, we were looking at our data, we've done 530 or so cases of ASC, which is the evolution of VBT, and I'll get to that. Mm -hmm. But if we look at that bag of 530 cases, about 45%, almost half the practice are curves that are well over 60 degrees. Mm -hmm. We're talking 70, 80, 90 degrees, and I'll show you those. So, it really transformed what we could treat just by modifying the procedure. Once I made a mini open incision, I got the ribs out of the way. The ribs were no longer in my way. And one of the biggest initial impacts that had was in the type of correction we could do. And if you want to look back and we can at the limitations of what VBT is, mm -hmm. the primary, these curves, they all go in and they rotate. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, they, they look like a, a C or an S on an X-ray, but they've gone in and they've rotated. Right. So the correction should be one that does that, right? Derotates. Mm -hmm. With VBT and tethering, you can only get it to 30. So you correct it down to 30, but you can't derotate at all because the ribs are in the way. Mm -hmm. And if you can't derotate, even if it grows, it grows flat. So it doesn't derotate. VBT, I, I try to make the analogy of like if you to, to patients, if you talk about metal rods, uh, metal rods is like the rotary phone, right? Mm -hmm. VBT was like the first flip phone. When we made the extension from VBT to ASC, it's, it's not a different technique in terms of different screws, different cords, same cord screws concept, but the way you get there and what you can do converted VBT from a flip phone to the first iPhone. Mm -hmm. And now five, six years later, 530 cases later, we're on iPhone six and seven. 
But if you're doing VBT, you're still on a flip phone. And that key distinction is the rotation. Okay. Can I ask a couple of follow-up questions to yes. that? Now, when you were mentioning that with the um, thoracoscopic uh, minimally, minimally invasive approach, uh, limited by a 60 degree curve, but only getting down to 30, is that why um, surgeons who are doing VBT are correcting, you know, in that range, 25, 30 degrees, because they can't get any tighter. You can't get, any, you can't get it any lower down. You can't get mm -hmm. it below 30. So if you have, and so if you go to some of those first cases, and well, why did that light bulb go off? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the first cases was uh, uh, a teenager that came in with a 50 degree curve which, within VBT, uh, but they were mature. They were 16, they weren't 12. So they had no growth left. So I can't leave it with 30 degrees. I'd have to make it straighter than that but I can't get it straighter than that unless I do a mini open procedure and some of the techniques that we evolved for ASC. So ASC very quickly became a corrective procedure, not a passive tethering procedure. And so I refuse in my practice to even call what we do tethering. I don't use a tether, I use a cord. It's that much of a pet peeve for me because it's that big a difference. <laughs> I understand because I always was under the impression that uh, curves were corrected to, you know, you know, 50% from 50 to 25 to 30 because um, of the fear of overcorrection. That's for the growing child, for yes. sure. And even with ASC principles applied to the growing child, mm -hmm. the, the principle of the ASC is it's like the, that uh, toy snake in the store. Mm -hmm. it has, you can curve it and it locks. And then you can't unlock it unless you release it and then it goes to where you want. That's like these curves. The curves go in and they rotate. So even if you have a uh, 50, 60 degree curve, it only goes to a certain point on its correction. And the reason for that is there's a tight ligament on the inside of the curve, the mm -hmm. anterior longitudinal ligament, mm -hmm. which is vested very tightly with these abnormal disc spaces because they're mm -hmm. tight on one side, they're a little fibrotic. And so if you try to de-spin and correct this curve, you can't do it unless you release a ligament, like a pie cut in a, in a pie. Yes. Once you release the ligament, and that's re like releasing that snake toy, all of a sudden you can de-spin it. And right. when you can de-spin it, you can take the torque out of it, you can detorque it. And so that's the difference between VBT and ASC. VBT doesn't do that at all. So when it grows in a growing kid, it grows flat. But with ASC, if you release it, and even though you don't want to go below 20 or so degrees correction with a growing child, mm -hmm. when they grow, they start to grow with the roundness. You're, that's why you see the, extra, uh, the clinical pictures where before surgery, they have really shallowness between the scapula but with AS with VBT, if you look afterwards, they still have that shallowness. But if you look at VBT, they start to round out. All right. And, and so even in the growing child, you just don't correct as far with ASC, but you still need to release and you still need to do that. So as they grow, they detorque themselves. And of course, you're referring to uh, you know the primary driver, one of the primary drivers for scoliosis, which is um, um, loss of the kyphosis of the thoracic spine leading to flat backs, hypokyphosis, and some- Almost every curve, like I said, they go in mm -hmm. and they rotate. And when you look from the side or from the back, that's a flat shallowness between the scapula. Right. Now, did you conceive of doing the, the, uh, the anterior release of the ALL in terms of trying to address the sagittal curve or the lack of- um, the, the it, it started- in terms of uh, the patients that started to come in. Okay. So um, that old, slightly older patient where I knew if I couldn't, so that was one of the first steps was going from the camera to the mini open. Mm -hmm. And then from the mini open to the one or two releases because I needed to get it below 20 degrees. I couldn't leave it with 20. Then a, a, then a ch teenager came in with a lumbar curve. Well, that's not VBT. VBT is defined as a chest curve with scope. And lumbar curve is obviously in mini open procedure. And so, so it evolved in that way. And it all involved in this practice. Um, all the milestones for, for developing uh, the advances of v, uh, most VBT to ASC and then for all sure all ASC occurred in this practice. And that's how it evolved. It evolved by answering the issues that were coming up. So if you're 17 and you have no growth and you have a 60 degree flexible curve, I can't leave you with 30 degrees. I have to make you straight. Absolutely. And with VBT um, being born out of the concept of uh, 
bone growth modulation and you know one two three years of growth left um, a lot of surgeons it becomes a bit of a controversial topic because you know with bbt there has to be growth but with you you're going towards you know late sanders late wrister spine the oldest and, patient i've operated on is 51 53 51. years old yeah and we've done um, many in their 40s and 20s and 30s. We're not restricted. The ASC opened up, like I said, like the bag. It's almost like you can treat almost every type of scoliosis with, with uh, ASC. It combines both remodeling and the other principle, which is tissue laxity, right? So if, if you put braces on your teeth, mm -hmm. we dentists will migrate your teeth over. There's remodeling occurring, but there's also a loosening and restoring occurring. Right. And so if you pull on your skin for a day, it bounces back. If you pull on your skin for three days, it's not quite as tight. Right. And so if you release the spine and you bring it over and you hold it there for a few weeks, when it reheals, it's rehealing with a new torque system. It's, that torque is not a driving it back the way it is in BBT. BBT, there's actually a fairly high failure rate in BBT. Mm -hmm. The reason for the failure is because you don't get it below 30 and then you're keeping that internal torque there. And that internal torque when it, if that cord does break, wants it to go way back because it, you never got rid of the internal torque. So are you saying that you have to get below 30 degrees correction and as close to zero as possible in order to reduce the amount of torque and the soft tissues from pulling it back? In a growing, in a non-growing teenager, you have to get them almost as straight as possible. In a growing teenager, you're still going to have a target sweet spot of that 20 degrees to allow for the growth. Mm -hmm. But by releasing the sp spine and then letting it reheal, it gets a new set point. That set point is 25 degrees, and then it will grow from there. If you in VBT, if you're just pulling it down and holding it at 25 or 30, there's no set point. It always wants to go back. And so if it doesn't grow quite far enough, it will rebound back. So are you saying that for VBT with a growing child, that 20 degrees it has to be at least 20 degrees or less it depends on their phase okay. of growth, where they are. oh you're just using that as a you're, you're as dialing a, in a certain remaining amount depending on where they are in their growth phase mm -hmm. but the principal difference being that you're releasing and starting from that new set point and we know that from our in this practice we know that from our huge curves where i've done 90 100 degree curves and what happens is i can't get them from like braces you know like braces on your feet. i can't get them from over here and here in one shot if it's a 90 100 degree curve I need to correct them down to about 50 the first time. Then I let them wait for five, six, nine months. They're getting flexible at 50 and 60. Then I go back and I revise that and bring it down to where we need to go. That's the difference also between ASC. VBT can't do that because you can't do revisions with the scope. It's, it's almost impossible. And that's, again, the further step that a lot of VBT surgeons, if you ask them, well, we can't do revisions and we're going to modify to a fusion if something goes wrong. It's not the case with ASC because ASC is a mini open. You actually can do the revision. Do you have to do you also, well, I assume you deflate the lung to do the mini open, yeah. right? So what's but the same with VBT? Yeah. Yes. So what's the difference in terms of the VBT surgeons not being able to do a number of resistions? Because when, when the, well, when the lung, he, um, first of all, a good understanding for families is you don't damage the lung by doing this. Right? Mm -hmm. Every time you take a breath, you inflate the lung. Every time you exhale, it deflates. And so this is like the inner tube of a tire. We let the air out of the tire, we do our work, and then we blow the tire back up. Mm -hmm. Whether it's VBT or ASC, same thing. But with VBT, when you're working through a scope, that scar tissue plane that heals between the lung and the chest wall, which is part of the normal healing process, mm -hmm. when you go back in with the scope, you can't see. There's no plane for the camera to get into because it's all scarred down. And so it's Im virtually impossible to do a revision. Almost every revision that you're going to do is going to end up being a mini open type revision. Right. Okay. And with the mini with the mini open, you can do it multiple it's, times. It's quite easy. It's actually not very hard at all. Okay. And so what's interesting about that, going back to uh, revisions or even staged surgeries where we do these big curves, mm -hmm. the second surgery is usually easier than the first surgery. So if, if teenagers are going back to uh, school around four weeks after ASC, and six weeks to sports after a revision or a stage surgery, they're going back to sports around four weeks. It's actually easier to get over. That's a huge difference between that and metal rod, right? If you have a revision with a metal rod, it took you three or four months to go back to school with a metal rod. It took you about a year to be allowed to go do any sport and you can't do what you used to do. 
And then if you have a revision or a stage for that, that's another year recovery. And that surgery is bigger than the first surgery. There's more blood loss, more infection. With ASC, it's the opposite. That's a, I just want to mention that one other point about metal rods. Sure. If you did a you know, 100 metal rod surgeries for a moderate size curve, there is a certain percentage that are going to need blood transfusions. You know, it could be 30%, 50%, depends on how big the curve is. You could, vers you could do almost any curve with ASC or VBT and you're not going to need a blood transfusion. It's a huge difference in size of surgery. Okay. Uh, this is a technical question, but with uh, the mini open approach with the ASC, do you use the same incision for lumbar curves as well as you would for thoracic curves in terms of uh, its approach? So my incisions are under the arm, and okay. so they stay tucked under the arm. Whether you have to do a thoracic curve, it's higher up. If it's a lumbar curve, it's lower down, and depending on the side. Okay. But all my incisions are tucked under the arm, so you can't really see them from the front. You can't really see them from the back. Mm -hmm. I understand. Um, in terms of your ASC, you also started to do, I guess, because of innovation that was necessary, and you and I assume you found that the health of the disc was, especially with severe curves, mature curves, was problematic, and you started to uh, develop disc release uh, techniques. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So, if you go back to the, you know, 530 cases, 45 percent are curves that are over 60 outside the range of even BBT. You can't treat those curves without releasing the spine. So it's not even a question of what, you know, should you do release? You, you can't do it unless you do release, right? Because unless you actually, so it, it's almost a catch 22, right? It, it's almost mandatory. As we started doing more and more releases in our bigger curves, it became very clear that they were as important to do in our smaller curves for that derotation component. And so if I started out six years ago and I was doing one or two, one or two releases, Per, per case. Now I'm doing four, five, six, seven releases per case. It depends. It's it's even more of a uh, uh, involved uh, with releases because that's how you get your corrections, and um, and that's been a steady progress over the. That's you know going from iPhone two to iPhone four basically, right? And uh, and, and it's that is that's the process. Um, the releases involves, like I said, releasing the anterior longitudinal ligament. And again, people need to realize that these are not normal discs. Right when they're crunched over in their scoliosis curve, that portion in the corner is not normal. It's fibrotic and tight, uh, and it's and and so by releasing it, it reheals. That's another thing that's not commonly understood out there. Um, but you'll see that if you go back on a stage surgery, that disc is actually reformed to some degree, and is still mobile. And so you, we know that the disc does not suddenly it does not mean it goes on to fusion by releasing it. In fact, what it does is it reheals and there's even been some cases where we can see new uh, nucleus propulsus. Uh, again, these are growing, a lot of times these are teenagers that are, their whole body is, is blooming, right? So, so the disc reforms, and that, but it reforms a new position. It's been opened and spun back to a different position. It reheals in that position and then it's mobile in that position. That's what generally happens. So in a sense, you have the shape of the disc, especially at the apex is gonna be uh, very much wedge shaped when you right. release it and you re reduce the tension and you derotate, it squares it off yes. and it gives it an opportunity to heal back. Is that where it's yeah. kind of that like what you're a, saying? A, and, and it reheals, but now it reheals without that internal torque that wants to go back. Okay. Because as you know, disc release tends to be a bit of a controversial topic. Yeah, it's a controversial topic for many. Uh, and it also, again, everything's context, right? Mm -hmm. So I spent half my life in adult surgery, and so does Dr. Betts, and, and half in, in, in children's surgery. Almost all the VBT surgeons out there are only pediatric surgeons, right? They haven't had the exposure of adult lumbar spine surgery and things. If, if you herniated a disc or I herniated a disc today, and it was one that required surgery, 99% of the time, the surgery would be just pluck out the piece of disc that herniated, and you would leave the disc alone. And it would, it would go on and heal, right? So that's where this information comes from in part. On top of that, a lot of the, the disc releases that we do do are in the thoracic spine. And the thoracic discs are not as crucial as like your L4-5 disc or L5-1 disc, which is low, low down and mechanical. Okay. Well, I was talking to uh, another spine surgeon recently and um, he also does uh, mature spines, immature spines, and he was, very interested in the maturation of the disc 
in terms of uh, as you exit adolescence, um, the shape and the biology of the disc changes, becoming a little bit more rigid. So he was, from his perspective, um, he was saying that as you hold the tether going towards maturity, it'll stabilize uh, the spine somewhat. Have you noticed that as well in terms of your part, as part of your practice? What would stabilize the spine, the, the cord or? No, the, the uh, as the disc kind of stiffens and into its new shape, as you hit maturity, then that would help to stabilize the spine. I, I think it stabilizes almost, you know, within a month or two. So, I mean, what we find on, on our, or in our situations is it, it just reacclimates to the new position. Again, it's, it, this is tissue remodeling. Uh, it's tissue remodeling, but it's also tissue laxity. And, and so uh, it, this is not against those principles. It is using those principles. And those principles probably happen a lot faster than we think uh, for the spine. It doesn't happen more faster than we think for teeth, right? We migrate teeth right over. You know, for skin, we pull on skin, it becomes saggy right away. Right. You know? Now, do you, uh, I think the whole world is kind of waiting for you to release data on uh, mature spine tethering in terms of yeah, um, the health of it. I don't say the word tethering. <laughs> Sorry, of uh, ASC. <laughs> yeah, so I, I presented it last year uh, in Finland on 440 cases. Uh, I presented the data at Eurospine, and, and that data was pretty clear. And now it's about formalizing it into um, the papers and things like that. But the data has been presented uh, internationally. Uh, and that's where I know. So I gave a talk right after Dr. Alan A, who presented on VBT, and that's how I know his his derotation correction was two percent, and our ASC correction was over ninety percent for derotation for derotation, and and uh, in terms of the correction of the other plane of your main uh, plane, our average corrections are between eighty eight and ninety three percent. The average correction of a metal rod is at most seventy five percent. And the average correction for VBT, uh, although that's a growing child, so before the growth, it's about 56%, with the growth up to 70%. But these are mild curves. These are curves that are not generally bigger than 45 degrees. Right. Okay. And you're going quite a bit of the time with even more severe curves. Now, yeah. in terms of, um, because you were mentioned that you do quite a few adult spines as well, do you find that... Uh, it's more difficult to stabilize those curves and, and especially with uh, cords often rupturing over time, right? Because um, they're an artificial uh, material. What's your perspective on that? Yeah, so it's the only difference between the adult spine and the um, teenager spine is that it's probably a little bit stiffer, mm -hmm. probably requires more releasing, uh, but you can end up with the same good result. In terms of a breakage, I explain it to the patients this way. If you did 100 metal rod surgeries for a double curve, you're gonna break two out of 100, right? Those metal rods are really strong. And so they're gonna last for three or four years and then they're gonna break. When they break, those two patients that broke their rods have to have it revised, redone. And so that's like 100% revision on their breakages, right? Not a high breakage rate, about two, two out of 100, but they do break. And um, that surgery, if it took you a year to recover the first time, it's going to take you a year to recover the second time. The, the blood loss is larger, and there's a high rate of blood transfusion with the first surgery. The infection rate is higher, right? If you did 100 cord surgeries for the same type category curve, we wouldn't transfuse any of the 100. Uh, we haven't had an infection, knock on wood, in 530 cases, we haven't had a single infection. Uh, so that puts it way, and again, this is about natural plane versus a man-made plane, right? In terms of breakages, the cords are going to break more often than metal rods, but the revision rate is about the same with ASC. That's not true for VBT. ASC, it's true because when the revision, when the breakage occurs and you've taken out that torque, that desire to go back to the same spot is not there. And so even if the cords break, they usually, they might settle a little bit, but not to the point where they require surgery. So when we analyzed those 440 cases and compared it, the revision rate is about the same as metal rods, because you, but you'll break more cords, right? But it doesn't translate into the revision because the, core, the spine, if you released it well, and it, it um, reheals to that new position, that internal torque to go back to where it was is not there. Okay. If I could just uh, move back a little bit to the discs and the disc health over time. Uh, 
it, was that part of your paper or your presentation in terms of disc health, or is that another paper coming? That's going to be that? something separate. The, okay. What we can t say at this point is that it doesn't uh, does not lead to uh, a discogenic back pain problem, right? Okay. We don't see that. Um, and what we notice on our some of these stage surgeries or revisions is that there's good uh, new healing of the disc that occurs. So a lot of it's anecdotal. Uh, a good study that we need to do is we're going to go ahead get MRIs on you know, a certain, a certain group of people that had their surgery done a year later and look at the disc. We've done that a few times and the discs are okay. It's not like they're uh, degenerating. Dr. Atanachi, what do you see in ASC that other surgeons aren't and why aren't more surgeons um, uh, basically following your lead? Are they just waiting for more data or what do you think it is? Some are, but it's, it's a big hurdle to start, even VBT or, or ASC. And so I've, tra I've trained about eight, nine surgeons throughout the world. I've done surgery in eight different countries. Um, and about three of those eight have taken up ASC fairly well. Um, the ones that are done that, you know, about a hundred cases each or so, right? Okay. Up until about a year ago, there was only about 15 people in the country doing VBT, okay? And, and uh, so Dr. and some Donny Schreiner's had the most, probably the most, I don't wanna say most or not. He has a lot of experience with VBT, but he was part of our Schrein, Schreiner's group. And then there were about eight to 10 others doing VBT. If you want to start doing VBT or ASC, the first thing you have to do is align yourself with a thoracic surgeon because you've not, typically you've not worked a lot from the front. You've done a lot of metal rod surgery from the back and you really were never trained to work in the front. So I've done so many that I do my own approaches and I don't, we have thoracic surgeon in the hospital, but they're not there for me during surgery. I don't need, need them. But if you're a new person starting out and all you've done is metal rod surgery for the last 15 years, you're going to have to get a thoracic surgeon to help you start the case and do the case with you. That's a big stumbling block, big hurdle. So even for VBT, that's a hurdle. What happened with VBT now, if you look at the VBT world right now, there's probably 30 or 40 that are, say they do VBT. There's still only 10 that really have experience with it, but there's about 30 or 40 that say. And what happened about a year ago was the company Zimmer got their marketing approval for their, for their instrumentation to set so that they could then say that they sell this for VBT, right? They didn't do it for ASC, they did it for VBT because that's where the data was coming from Shriners. And, um, but once they got that marketing approval, they could then start putting on a weekend workshop here, weekend workshop there to show surgeons what VBT is. And so VBT has gotten a little bit of a surge of following in the last year, only in the last year because of that. Still a flip phone, not an iPhone. <laughs> You can use both Zimmer and Globus, but you tend to stick with Globus, I believe, right? Yeah, it's irrelevant which one I use. It's just a matter of, of, okay. uh, of sourcing and regularity and things like that. And I know Globus is, uh, well, you know, there's competition, Zimmer, Globus, et cetera, in terms of the instrumentation. And, and just and for your viewers, I have no relationship with the company whatsoever. Okay, fair enough. But are you aware of, uh, I believe Globus was supposed to uh, release um, a bigger, thicker uh, tether. Do you know any information about that? Um, I, it's coming out at some point. I don't think it's gonna be a, a major change that is required. When we look at what issues there are, that's not really the, the issues that, so I wouldn't hesitate to have what the cord that's currently available versus the cord. So some of the iPhone 7, 9 techniques that I do is I add more cords. Like I'm not even doing just two cords. Sometimes I'm adding supplement cords. Uh, and so uh, that's the, the new information with Globus. Yes, it'll be uh, a nice thing to have, but it's not something that's changing on the presence of my mind. Right. It's not going to be necessarily revolutionary. Right. And since you brought it up, can you talk a little bit about your supplemental cords? Yeah, it's it's. I'd rather not. It's 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 just belt and suspenders. It's like where you might add a reinforcement cord here and there. I would tell you. I can tell you this, and this this is uh, about my technique with the double cords and double screws. So VBT is clearly one screw per level, right? Mm -hmm. Because with the scope, you can't actually put two screws. You just physically can't do it. Um, I migrated to the point where I, I do two lines of screws and two cords. And the first cord and screw line helps derotate to here. The, 
the second cord screw line helps derotate even further. Mm. Right. So it acts, it's like tying a boat. You anchor the back end and then you swing the nose around. And that's what some of the double cord, double screw uh, technique allows for. It also decreases breakages and things like that. But personally, I think the most important part of it is improving our derotations. Fascinating. Yeah. And uh, do you tend to limit that more to the lumbar spine in terms of? No, it's throughout. Right. Yeah. So it, it just I can show you if, you if you want to take some time, I can go through slides and things with you. But but yeah, no, the technique that uh, iPhone six five six four whatever it was is almost double screws at every level. Okay. Yeah. The only times you don't is when the bone is so small you can't really get two screws there. Okay. Yeah. Um, why don't we, if you do have some um, uh, slides that we can go through, I was, I'm interested in your parameters for immature, uh, maturing and adult spines. Would you be able to take us through that? Yeah, and just so, so you know, I, this is not prepared for you. This is what a talk that I give to patients every time I talk to them. With the Zoom, it's very nice to be able to do that. So, sure. but here is, uh, I'm gonna just share a screen. Good, uh, you can see this now? Yes, I can. Okay, so I did get a little prepared by pulling up the right slides for you. Um, but, um, you know, this over here, this might be a, a picture for you of, of like my ASC technique, which is like two cords, two screws, uh, VBT technique, which is a sing single line. Uh, but this is what I mean about the limitation of VBT. So these are not my cases. These are cases that are, are published by other surgeons. And first of all, you can notice that these are mild, moderate curves that they're treating. And this is what VBT would do in a growing child, getting it to about 23 or so. Um, this is obviously a more mature um, uh, um, individual or later in their growth after it's been corrected. Uh, but the main side view here is that it's completely straight, right? It hasn't derotated at all. Uh, if you compare this to an ASC, ASC, you can get that roundness back. And what that does is improves your neck posture. And we showed that, I, you know, a group at me and some uh, people at Shriners in 2011 published a whole study on the cervical neck uh, issues with scoliosis because that, um, because you can see my hands also on this, you know, because that spine goes in and rotates, the neck will pitch forward, right? And so that's what you see preoperatively. You see this hypokyphosis and then the neck pitching forward. If you derotate and correct the roundness here, the neck will start to improve itself. But VBT does not do any of that. And that's, that's the limitation that we keep referring to. Um, getting to your point about how you decide what and where. Um, well, this is what's broken down in terms of what are candidates for VBT versus what's a candidate for ASC. And what you can say see right away is that the curve is generally, as we talked about, between 30 and 65 degrees you can do VBT. If it's flexible, less than 30, you can do VBT. If it's a growing spine, you can do VBT, right? However, as I will, was trying to make the argument, no matter what, even in that category, you're better off with ASC because it's going to derotate your spine. By greater than 90%, you'll get improvement in your roundness of your back, whereas with VBT, it's less than 2%. This is the critical factor here. And your average corrections are going to be much higher with, with the ASC. Uh, so then, you, you know, what does ASC do? It does curves that are well over 65. It addresses the thoracic hypo, hypokyphosis, that's that inwardness. Uh, you can do curves that are stiff or flexible. You can do curves that are old or young, uh, adult curve and complex curves, and you can do stage surgery, none of which you can do with VBT. Um, in terms can of the mild question, stuff, Dr. Antti? Yeah. So for the... So for improving the kyphosis, reducing the hypokyphosis of the thoracic spine, is it, what's the mechanism of, of, of freeing, much, freeing up more flexibility? Is it due to the disc release? The anterior uh, longitudinal ligament is that tight band. Mm -hmm. and that, that's a big culprit in this, in investing with those corners of the discs where they're, where they're degenerative and tight. And so releasing it allows the disc space to open and despin. And, even, and so on the surgery, when you're on your side, that curve is in and up mm -hmm. and the maneuvers of the surgery are down and round. And that's what brings it back down with, and that's the technique. You know, it, this is not new, even with metal rod surgery. If you had a large 90 degree curve, 80 degree curve, and you were gonna do metal rods from the back and it was stiff, you would go to the front of the spine first, release the spine, and then go to the back and do the metal rods. 
So none of these concepts are new. It's just being applied in a very specific way. Very good. Yeah. Uh, I just put this in here because, you know, just to emphasize that you how we got here with the history of 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 the uh, of the process was that first lumbar case for ASC was in 2014. That's 11 to L3, obviously not a VBT case, not a candidate for VBT. It's a lumbar case. And then we went to the first double curves, the first with overlap, non overlapping screws, first overlapping screws, converting the first vertebral body stapling to ASC. Doing the first release was around January of 2015 for this girl from the United Kingdom. Then combining scoliosis with uh, corrections of spondylolisthesis, the first ASC for spinal cord injury, uh, first congenital ASC, the oldest ASC, the youngest ASC, et cetera. It's all occurred in this practice because of this think tank. Um, I can show you some of the comparison between metal rod and even some video here. So obviously this is someone I did with metal rods, you know, nine years ago. Um, and obviously a big incision, big surgery from the back, same type of curve. This is one of the early ASCs uh, six years ago, uh, similar corrections, but what, and, but you can, obviously you can't see the incisions very much. There's no major muscle disruption at all. Uh, but when you look at the motion, this is where it becomes obvious. Uh, if you look at the motion with the metal rod, you have to pivot below the metal rod. And if you are looking at the ASC, you can have um, normal rotation and curves and using the full aspects of your spine. Here he's pivoting, she's arching, right? Mm -hmm. Again, on the extension, same thing. He has to pivot, she can arch and use her whole spine. And if you side to side, he pivots side to side, she arches side to side. And that's the difference between cord and metal rod. Um, in terms of types of curves, like obviously this is on the very high end of VBT if you were to do it, but you wouldn't release the spine. And with VBT, you would never get it this straight, right? And now this person obviously didn't have a lot of growth left. And so I tried to make it as straight as possible. Um, this is what it looks like from the side, just like the model. Um, this is this same girl, but this is nine days after surgery, right? So with ASC and, and even VBT, the recovery rates are quite quick because it's less invasive surgery. But you know, where can you take ASC where you can't take VBT? Well, ASC can do 65 degree curves and get them like that. You, know, you can do 78 degree curves and get them like that. Um, and this is clinically what it will look like. And this is the difference also between VBT. Now you'll see some roundness appearing. That's the derotation effect of pulling it out and derotating and rounding out the back. Um, here, this was an 86 degree curve. Uh, and this, you can see how much roundness improvement of that thoracic kyphosis uh, was achieved. And that was a multiple release uh, type situation. Here's a more mild curve, 51 degrees. But even in this situation, you'll see the roundness filling out much more appropriately. Um, extreme cases, 90 degree curves with ASC, uh, you can actually, uh, again, this was a stage surgery. So it was done in two parts, uh, but going from 90 degrees to seven degrees and getting this kind of contour. And here's another, a different girl. Uh, and the reason I brought this up is, again, this was a stage surgery, 90 degrees before, about uh, 13 or so degrees after. But you can see even in those severe cases, and even with One stage surgery, you can Let really forward. get the motion with the cord. Quick question. Yes. With ASC, since you are releasing the, uh, doing the anterior release in the ALL, and you're doing multiple disc releases, do you find that your tether breakage rates are less because there's less torque trying to push it back to the original curve? My personal opinion on that is yes. Uh, we have to go back now and, and analyze. So I have you know, data for now six years of single cord, single screws, single cords, uh, double cord, double screws with releases, without releases. And so we kind of have to, to um, and then mature and immature and, and the whole gamut. And so now those are great questions that need to be broken down and see uh, the, the overall uh, revision rate for ASC is around 3%. And that's all cumbers, even the 90 degree curve. So that's who needs a revision if in, so it's a very low rate and that's actually comparable to metal rods. Um, but then within that group, you know, is there slightly less breakage in uh, in one group versus another, and and with what techniques we we're doing at the time? 
I will tell you that this though, the vast majority of breakages of chords are improvements in curve balance, not, not detriments. And that sounds funny at the first. So, well, be, and the answer to that is as you get into these older, more mature curves, I'm making them as straight as I think they need to be, right? But they always have other, they have a residual neck curve, they have a residual lumbar curve, but I, I made them as straight as possible. That may not be where that brain and where that eye gaze wants to exactly be in space. And so what we may notice is that that cord may break at some point, but it improved their overall balance. We look at that x-ray and then after that break, you know what, that actually looks a little bit better than when it wasn't broken. That's a good, good portion of the breaks. Do you have a hard number to the, the number of uh, cord breaks you have witnessed over, your, over the years? Say again, please. How, do you have an actual number to the cord break it, breaks that you've seen? Uh, no, uh, we haven't looked at that. It's not, um, we look at it as revision more than that. So if it, if it breaks and it requires a revision, then that's something that's of an issue. And that's another teaching element that needs to get out there is that in my opinion, the vast majority of breaks are actually beneficial, not, not beneficial. That's almost the opposite logic. You say, well, a break must be bad. No, actually the truth is that most of the breaks are actually beneficial, not non-beneficial. And so, um, and so we try to get away from that by looking at, well, if it breaks, does it need a revision? And that revision rate is, is quite low. Now, some surgeons uh, are kind of looking at hybrids um, in terms of selective fusion thoracic spine. Yeah. With so, a, I, I, so again, the, the practice has gone through all this. And, and uh, about five years ago, I did about nine, eight, seven, something like that, eight, seven, eight or nine uh, hybrid situations where those were some of those initial cases. They had 80, 90 degree thoracic curves and a flexible way. So we do a cord here, but we selectively fuse the upper portion, right? Mm -hmm. But, and, and that does work to some degree, but there's some residual um, imbalance because you have a rigid segment above a, a below a flexible cord. So I stopped doing those. And that was after about eight or nine of those cases. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I started staging the surgeries and now we're getting results like this girl on your screen. So same thing here, you could say, well, let's do a metal rod down to here and then flexible here. Why? When you can get this kind of result with the cord. So basically, uh, if, you can, if you can get the results ASC wise and sometimes better correction, then why go to fusion at all? Correct. Okay. You know, think about it in terms of even for the major, you know, 90 plus degree curves, staging surgery, like braces on your teeth, getting it to where you want, as opposed to trying to replace your teeth in the portion and then move it, right? Mm -hmm. And other surgical techniques included uh, are that may be being investigated right now are selective fusion, maybe one or two levels to the lumbar spine and tethering those as well. But again, from your point of view, why when you can get the correction you need with the SC? Yeah. Okay. yeah I think they're just going through phases that we've been through. <laughs> So, let me just show you a couple more because these are, 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 are interesting other types of cases. So lumbar, you know, this is a, a teenager. This is a large, and, and you got to say, well, this can't be VVT. It doesn't even qualify for VVT, right? So here's a 70, almost 70 degree lumbar curve. This is what he looked like uh, before the surgery. And you can see the huge um, lumbar rotation uh, and very stiff. He's 40, only bends out to 40 degrees. And this is the day of surgery, right? And I can tell you that I probably did release up in this upper area. I probably stayed away from releasing down in this area, but I released up here and, and this is his uh, correction. And if, if you look at his motion after the surgery, this is about uh, two years after. You must enjoy your work. Very rewarding. It's hard not to be rewarded. And uh, and then, you know, how extreme can it get? This is a ninety degree same type of situation, right? And then I was I had threw up uh, some other curves for you to look at, but again, eighty five. This is seventy five down in the waist. Another one. This is the VBT. This is not my case, but I did revise it. Um, this is a VBT that didn't quite get the correction because you can only get it to 30, didn't grow out. And so then I went back and I revised it with the ASC technique. Uh, and same, uh, this one too, this is an overcorrected VBT. 
Uh, again, you know, it's hard to say this is not VBT uh, classically because they did do the lumbar portion as well. Uh, but um, without the principles of ASC that you can end up, and I'm not trying to say ASC is the perfect thing, but you know, we've been through the process in this practice. And so this is the revision that I was able to achieve and you can see the improvement with the double cords, double screws and how you can really get the proper contour. Um, I'm not sure what this one is. And here's another, uh, this was another revision that I had to do for somebody. Um, anyway. Well your, well, your practice is always evolving. Yes. Where do you see it headed in terms of what's the next uh, version of ASC that you see coming down the pipeline? Um, I think the principles need to be um, solidified mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. We, we've kind of invented it over the last five years in terms of where we're at. Don't start doing this because we can show you what that did, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot, all this stuff is good. I don't mean like, you know, just because something didn't pan out as good relative to what it was before that at the time, it was even better, right? But you don't need to five years later do uh, selective metal rod fusion with the hybrid when we know you can do a better way with a better, you know, with ASC in itself, those kind of principles, right? Uh, and where, where this might be going over time is just improvements in our uh, implants, but that will take probably a decade. You know, it takes a long time to get through uh, implant improvements that get pr processed properly. The cord that we use today uh, that original uh, cord that came out from Zimmer, we started in 2011, that was approved in 1999 for low back surgery. That's where it came from. We used it from the low back system to the here. And, and that means it had been studied for 10 years prior to that, all throughout the 90s. So it's not a quick process. It's about trying to maximize what you can do in the current field. And um, I think the improvements that will occur over the next several years is, is through teaching, like we're gonna ha have to um, expound this to others. Like it, it, VBT to me is not the answer. It was an answer at the time, but we've progressed so far past VBT and those principles need to get out there. Very good. Well, Dr. Antonacci, thanks very much for going over your, um, your information, your, your, um, your cases and your your logic in terms of uh, surgical decisions. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, learned a lot. I think I have to review this about 10 times just to get a little bit more, um, <laughs> have it sink into my brain a little bit more. Thank you very much and appreciate your time. Thanks, Derek. It was nice to talk to you. Okay. Bye-bye.